and this is the video about colonial propaganda continued uh, as uh, the previous video was uh, interrupted by myself after a very suspended and mysterious indeed uh, simply because my time was running out so uh, I was speaking about colonial ideas uh, spread by uh, different actors and media in popular culture and as an example I was about to present and, and study the first three stanzas of a famous poem by Rudyard Kipling called The White Man's Burden which I um, as I already said was the uh, probably the most famous colonial um, text or at least uh, text presenting uh, colonial ideas so i will read these three stanzas first and then we will focus on a couple of topics take up the white man's burden send forth the best you breed go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives need to wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild your new coat, sullen peoples, half devil and half child. Take up the white man's burden, in patience to abide, to veil the threat of terror and check the show of pride, by open speech and simple, and hundred times made plain, to seek another's profit and work another's gain. Take up the white man's burden, the savage wars of peace, Fill full the mouth of famine, and bid the sickness cease. And when your goal is nearest, the end for others sought. Watch thloth and heathen folly bring all your hopes to naught. So, apart from the literary quality of this text, which is uh, I assume very important and very high uh, I think uh, there are a couple of messages about Kipling's views on colonialism which are expressed in these lines and I think Kipling's views were uh, largely shared in particular by uh, a wide range of people in the uh, intellectual elite of Victorian Britain and the first point I would like to examine is what is said about the uh, colonized people the natives uh, one adjective which is uh, highlighted in the third stanza is the adjective heathen which is another way to mean pagan that is to say non-christian but uh, the reason why I, I mentioned that is that you know the uh, missionary mission uh, of um, the religious mission of the colonizers was something that was uh, heavily put forward in propaganda, and I think because it was indeed for for some white people, so some white colonizers, a, a real goal. But by far the, the most remembered line about the natives is new called sullen peoples, half devil and half child, which is a line <laughs> which sounds terribly racist nowadays. In fact, it was already racist in those days. If we define racism as uh, uh, at least a, a feeling of despise towards people which are considered one way, or one way or another inferior and here uh, the, the, the terms devil and child even if child is supposed to sound kind of positive uh, is clearly putting the colonized people the natives in an inferior position and uh, with a, a, a negative dimension. In fact, uh, those people 
for a man like Kipling are close to um, a kind of animality of savagery which is the meaning of half devil and the only reason why these negative aspects are accepted and forgiven by Kipling is that he considers native people to be kind of children for whom the white man we can understand that can be a father so uh, the most positive way we could uh, describe this attitude to the natives would be to call it a patronizing perspective but patronizing is not very positive anyway another thing which is said in in the poem is a, a definition of the objectives of colonization and here the line that I have selected to veil the threat of terror uh, I think it's probably a reference to uh, the uh, abolition of slavery and more generally of any uh, cultural or social characteristic which uh, was considered by European people as uh, too old-fashioned and morally wrong to seek another's profit and work another's gain here uh, we have Kipling basically saying that colonization is made only in uh, in the benefit or for the benefit of uh, the colonized people which I think is um, at least in the beginning of the poem a very hypocritical stance because never is the interest of Britain presented in these lines maybe it is later in the poem but to be honest with you I don't remember the other lines I should read them again feel full the mouth of famine and bid the sickness cease uh, would it, it may illustrate something that we would call um, uh, nowadays humanitarian program uh, or uh, help aid to development uh, if we were in a geography lesson so yeah the idea that Europeans would arrive with better solutions to solve social and sanitary problems is something which is illustrated here that's part of the civilizing mission uh, that the Europeans believe they had the end for others sought is another way to uh, uh, say that the end the objective of colonization is something that is an objective for the natives and never uh, in favor of the Europeans power or, or economic interest or anything like this that is the choice made by Kipling here and finally uh, when talking about uh, what colonization means for the Europeans the well I would say the sh very shocking uh, opinion of Kipling about colonization I say shocking because seen with hindsight here from from uh, contemporary times uh, is saying that you know colonizing is a duty almost a kind of uh, uh, divine mission a mission given by God to Europeans to to suffer for the benefit of the rest of mankind uh, which is uh, far from the reality of what colonization was I mean I this uh, this opinion does not uh, resist to uh, three seconds of historical analysis and yet he speaks very very explicitly of the burden of something heavy that must be carried a difficult task uh, that must be uh, 
uh, made by the Europeans, uh, that some uh, young people will be sent to exile, will die, send forth the best you breed, and uh, that shamefully the the goals of colonization will not be understood by the natives and Kipling believes it's a shame. Uh, he says that the natives will bring all your hopes to note, which means to nothing. So Europeans will not be rewarded by colonization. Um, I think it's pure fantasy. I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's very irrealistic. Uh, it's a very irrealistic way of presenting colonization. And, uh, and the fame of this poem, its success, and the way it is uh, accepted as something representative of the mentalities of the late 19th century in Britain uh, is very striking. Just to show you s the impact in those days of a poem like this, you can have a quick look uh, on this uh, American cartoon by Victor Gillum, uh, which is um, a kind of a <coughs> uh, humoristic uh, illustration of the white man's burden. I say humoristic because uh, uh, Gillam knew that he was, uh, you know, ma making fun of a poem that was supposed to be extremely serious. That's the reason why uh, uh, the title includes apologies to Rudyard Kipling. And well, where, where uh, uh, a uh, character known as John Bull, which represents Britain, and Uncle Sam, which represents the USA, which uh, it was believed might be uh, on the brink of starting a colonial policy, which did not happen, uh, are, are carrying the burden uh, of, of um, you know, bringing uh, native people from the colonies, so people from all around the world except the Western world, Europe or, or North America, to uh, civilization, uh, very uh, uh, difficult to road, uh, dangerous uh, with all these rocks uh, that must be uh, uh, overtaken, uh, the rocks of brutality, ignorance, superstition. Well, I think uh, Gillam uh, really understood what Kipling wanted to say. He just said it a different way I don't know if Gillam was critical of colonization, really. I, I think maybe he was, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. But I think that uh, seen from today, uh, this cartoon demonstrates what was, well, I must say ridiculous in, in Kipling's poem and in, in his message. Really. The white man's burden was so famous uh, at the beginning of the 20th century that the expression was also used in uh, advertising. And uh, here, well, you can see uh, it's an advertising poster for soap. And uh, what is uh, said here is that uh, it is the white man's burden to uh, teach native people from uh, Africa or South America uh, the basic rules of hygiene. Uh, if we zoom on uh, the bottom of the poster, you can uh, uh, read uh, these lines that explain the point which is made here. And I, I think it's particularly interesting to, to have a look at the drawing uh, on the right side showing uh, uh, a sitting native African or native South American man dressed in a very primitive way which is being given a soap by a European missionary or, or something it is of course uh, in something that is not political it's not a political document but it shows how deeply um, colonialism was uh, uh, 
spread and, and rooted in popular culture. Uh, one last example of the uh, um, the way colonial propaganda was uh, was done in Britain and also in France, but firstly in Britain, great exhibitions were organized in London in particular. The documents I'm showing here uh, are, are from uh, an exhibition that was called the Colonial and Indian Exhibition and that took place in South London in 1886. And it was a great success because more than 5 million visitors came to this exhibition where you could see um, artifacts uh, from uh, the various colonies of uh, Britain uh, and the, the exhibition was also a way to show how big uh, the British Empire was and so how uh, Great Britain had, uh, had, had, had in fact become a greater Britain so you can see how uh, on the postcard, the souvenir postcard, how the this uh, vast um, s scope, s spatial scope of the British Empire is shown by showing different types of ethnic groups which are dominated by the British, from uh, the people of North America to, uh, to to the people in Africa or, or Asia. Exactly the same kind of exhibitions would take place in France, maybe a bit later, and the, the great exhibition in France was in the 1930s. And this poster that I used as a, a front page of this lesson is also a poster that could be bought uh, uh, in uh, the Colonial and Indian Exhibition of 1886. It is written uh, at the bottom of this, uh, of this document. And so, uh, an example in France. Uh, exhibitions were smaller in those days in France because the empire was smaller. Uh, nevertheless, they, they took place. And uh, what is uh, particularly striking in the pre-World War I exhibitions that were done in France, because this was not really done anymore after that, was the fact that in these exhibitions, black African people were really exhibited as if they were animals in a zoo. And in fact, the expression human zoo is often used to denounce uh, the disgrace that these exhibitions uh, were. You can see how the propaganda poster, the advertising poster, promoted the event by insisting on the, I would say, the, the exotic aspect of the people uh, the darkness of their skin is uh, highlighted, is exaggerated on this, on this poster. And uh, the picture taken in Rouen in 1896 shows the kind of uh, um, scenes that the African people which were um, brought to Europe and paid actually, they were paid, probably not a lot, but they were paid, uh, what they had to do in these exhibitions. It's as if the, what the Europeans believed to be a, a, civiliz a civilization gap between themselves and the Africans was exaggerated by the, the setting of the scene. Uh, you can see these uh, uh, well-dressed European people, French people, looking at Africans bathing in the water in Rouen. We can see that some of them are freezing cold. Um, and uh, it is very likely that uh, those families that were brought here uh, were maybe educated people from Africa, uh, students often which were paid to, to, to do that. Of course, it was a disgrace for, for the French society, and it's something that everybody is ashamed of nowadays, 
but it happened. Another thing that happened and that uh, survived the late, uh, well, the early 20th century, much longer than the human zoos, was the uh, banania character created for advertising uh, a product which was, uh, you know, uh, a mix of uh, cocoa and uh, uh, banana uh, for, for kids, that you, you chocolate milk. And, uh, well, during World War I, mm, the people that worked on this uh, advertising campaign found an idea and they decided to illustrate Banania with uh, a character, uh, a, a, a native African soldier fighting for France. The name given to these soldiers fr from Africa that fought World War I and died in French trenches was tirailleur sénégalais and so banania was a tirailleur sénégalais he's dressed this way uh, he is wearing a, a uniform of the french army the uniform of the tirailleur sénégalais you can see the three colors of our flag and um, and uh, he is a, a character where cliches about the african man are exaggerated the character is definitely exotic. Exotic means, you know, something that um, is really different from you and the place where you live. He is uh, very childish, excessively happy, and as a happy child, he is uh, excessively obedient and in fact submitted to French authority. Of course, the character of uh, Banania is a racist representation of the African man that was long lasting because the, the advertisement uh, was still published in the 1970s and it, wa it was quickly reintroduced uh, 15 years ago but because there was a scandal uh, due to the racist dimension of the, uh, of the campaign it was soon abandoned. But it went down in history, and everybody remembers that in the French uh, society. And uh, well, with this last, these last documents, because another one is coming, I want to illustrate the fact that the image of the colonized people, even this image was not free. I mean, it was not an image that was freely provided by native people. It was an image that was made up, planned by propaganda. So you see, in, in, in the colonial um, relationship, the colonized people are not even in control of their image. Have a look at this postcard. Uh, it, it shows uh, a type of uh, woman which was known as the Moresque. Uh, pictures of Moresque women were erotic pictures, erotic postcards uh, that were uh, very popular in France, not only in, Alge in French Algeria but also in, in, in France. Uh, which uh, where uh, women from North Africa were dressed I in a very um, sexy way. Okay. And what is interesting is that um, this this corresponded to uh, a white man's uh, fantasy, but very uh, only very little to reality because in North Africa, uh, women were really um, uh, seriously dressed, I mean. Nudity I was not a uh, defining um, aspect of the North African women at the beginning of the 20th century. And yet, this figure of the Moresque was totally created uh, by, uh, by, the white, uh, by the white men. And what is remarkable is that 
in, in other parts of the French colonial empire, in sub-Saharan Africa, nudity was an element of the everyday life of African women. But for some reasons, this reality was not considered interesting for uh, creating and selling erotic postcards. So I, I, I think this example is interesting because it shows how uh, the image of the colonia colonized people was something almost totally controlled by the colonizers. And to conclude this part about colonial propaganda, I would like to say that uh, it is important to understand that colonialism was not only conquest and political economic administration. Colonialism was also a doctrine, a set of ideas, promoted by an intense and rather successful propaganda. Successful in the sense that it managed to convince many white people that they belonged to a specific race, or at least to a nation which was more advanced than others in the process of civilization. Uh, the long-lasting impact of these racist stereotypes is remarkable because many of these stereotypes still live today in mentalities, in our culture. And in fact, we are in 2020 and we have nowadays this uh, very important social movement largely uh, supported by the youth which fights again and again racism. So this, this impact, long impact of the racism that was created in the 19th century, I mean it almost did not exist before, or it was not, a, racism was not a popular idea before the 19th century. People did not, did not really know what it was. Of course in, in, the, in the French colonies of the in the Caribbean, uh, black people were still oppressed by white people. But I mean, uh, it was not a, an important aspect of the French or British culture. Nobody really cared uh, at home in France. In the 19th century, it became a widely spread idea that uh, the white nations, like Britain or France, were more advanced, not only technologically, but also morally, than uh, other communities in Africa, for example. And uh, this colonial doctrine is one aspect of the nationalist doctrines that spread throughout the 19th century in Europe. And what is also very interesting is that it worked very well. It became a very important dimension of the culture of European societies in the late 19th century. And this is extraordinary and tragic, but extraordinary because one century before, uh, European societies did not even see themselves as a nation. The, they believed they were peasants and uh, they worked for their king, uh, but the idea of a nation was barely born. And one century later, not only was the idea of nation strongly rooted in the mind of the people, but many European people already believed that their nation was uh, better than the others. That was the 19th century.